Good evening. Welcome to Victor Victorian Storytime. I am your host, the Storyteller, and this is the Archive. It is my pleasure to share with you stories from around the world. Thank you for joining me. Tonight we have a wonderful selection. We shall, as always, begin with Shakespeare, and then a fairy tale from Hoffman of Nutcracker fame, and then a few poems of passion from Wilcox, followed by the first of Kipling's Jungle Book stories, and finally finishing up with a reading from Pepys's diary. And so, without further ado, let us begin. Now, when last we left Shakespeare, we had finished sonnets three and four. And so, for those of you keeping score at home, today shall be five and six. And so, sonnet five. Those hours that with gentle work did frame the lovely gaze where every eye doth dwell will play the tyrants to the very same, and that unfair which fairly doth excel. For never resting time leads summer on to hideous winter, and confounds him there, sap checked with frost, and lusty leaves quite gone, beauty o'er snowed, and bareness everywhere. Then were not summer's distillation left, a liquid prisoner pent in walls of glass. Beauty's effect with beauty were bereft, nor it nor no remembrance what it was, but flower distilled, though they with winter meet, lease but their show, their substance still lives sweet. Hmm. The preservation of beauty outside of the season is but borrowed. Hmm. Curious. Now, another winter sonnet. Number six. Then let not winter's ragged hand deface in thee thy summer, ere thou be distilled. Make sweet some vile, treasure thou some place with beauty's treasure, ere it be self-killed. That use is not forbidden usury, which happies those that pay the willing loan. That's for thyself to breed another thee, or ten times happier, be it ten for one. Ten times thyself were happier than thou art, if ten of thine ten times refigured thee. Then what could death do if thou shouldst depart, leaving thee living in posterity? Be not self-willed, for thou art much too fair to be death's conquest and make worms thine heir. We see here in six a mixture of the imagery we have encountered in the previous five, of summer to winter, of barrenness, of too much looking inward, of not sharing, of not reproducing, and beauty being wasted. I imagine we shall see more of the same in coming summer but we shall leave Master Shakespeare there. And move now to E.T.A. Hoffman, uh, writer of perhaps my favorite Christmas tale, The Nutcracker. Uh, Hoffman also wrote a number of other fairy tales. And for this one, we shall read now The Magic uh, Spectacles. Once upon a time, there were two young men who went to the university to study science. They had played together as children, and Lothair's sister Claire was Nathaniel's sweetheart. It was agreed that when Nathaniel had finished his studies and begun his career, the young couple should be married. But first, there were examinations to be passed. Both students worked very hard, but Nathaniel rose early and stayed up half the night, poring over his books by flickering candlelight until his eyes were red and sore. Their tutor, a uh, Professor Spallanzani, noticed and paid special attention to him. This man was a strange being, very tall and gaunt and very learned. He spent a great deal of his time shut up in his laboratory, working on mysterious experiments. 
Now it happened one day that the two students had to take some work that they had just finished to their tutor. He lived in a house right opposite the one in which they lodged. While they were waiting for him in his study, they noticed a half-open door which led into another room. Just inside was sitting a very beautiful girl in a costly silk gown. The two young men stood looking at her, and she stared back without so much as a blink. They both began to feel very uncomfortable. Lothair looked down at the floor, Nathaniel muttered an apology, but the young woman continued to stare in silence. Just then the professor came in, and seeing the door open, shut it hurriedly. When he had looked at their work and the students were about to leave, he called Nathaniel back. Tell me, Nathaniel, he said, fixing his beady black eye on the student. You saw my daughter, my Olympia? Uh, well, well y yes, stammered Nathaniel, remembering how rudely he and Lothair had stared. On the other hand, Olympia had stared quite as hard, in fact, a good deal harder. What did you think of her? asked the professor. She is very beautiful, admitted Nathaniel, relieved that he could tell the truth without mentioning her staring. Quite so, quite so, said the professor. You must visit us some evening. It is time that she had some young company. What did he say? asked Lothair when his friend joined him in the hall. He wants some young people to meet his daughter, said Nathaniel. Why, that girl who stares so hard, exclaimed Lothair. She seems a very odd girl, but then the professor is a very strange man. Her name is Olympia, continued Nathaniel. She seems fond of staring. I have seen her sitting at that window opposite ours, idly staring out for hours on end. Perhaps she is simple, suggested Lothair. Simple, exclaimed Nathaniel. Quite half-witted, I'd say. She may think we are freaks. We stared too, said Lothair, and began to laugh. They both laughed so heartily that they did not notice a man who was coming into the house as they were leaving, and they bumped into him. Look where you are going, he exclaimed indignantly. You must be blind, blind as bats. With that, he darted across the hall and disappeared into the professor's study. But another odd man, said Nathaniel, as they crossed the street to their lodgings. Uh, that is Dr. Capellius, the optician, explained Lothair. He was pointed out to me the other day. I, I think he is a friend of the professor's, and they make scientific experiments together. An optician, exclaimed Nathaniel, for that was a very rare profession in those days. He makes spectacles, explained Lothair. By the look of your infl inflamed eyes, Nat, you could do with a pair yourself. Lothair was not the only person who thought so. The next day, while Nathaniel was alone, poring over his books with a wet towel round his aching brows, there was a rat-a-tat on the door, which immediately flew open, and in bounced Dr. Coppelius. He was quite the oddest man Nathaniel had ever seen. A bulbous nose stuck out between bulging red cheeks, but the chin and ears were pointed, and round the back of a big bald head hung an untidy fringe of white hair. He wore a rusty black coat, whose tails flapped behind him, and a stained waistcoat was straining the buttons over a pot belly. Ah, sore eyes, he said, with seeming satisfaction. Too much study by candlelight. You need spectacles. I don't, protested Nathaniel. His eyes were really very sore, but he was annoyed that this strange man had not waited to be asked in. Oh, yes, you do, insisted the man. Allow me to introduce myself. Dr. Capellius at your service, maker of spectacles, telescopes, magnifying glasses, and barometers. Now let me see uh, spectacles. Ah, yes. With that, Dr. Capellius felt in his coat pocket, and out of them he took with surprising speed pair after pair of spectacles. There were large ones, small ones, some with thick lenses, some with thin, some with rose-colored glass, and others with dark lenses. I don't want any, protested Nathaniel. 
rather feebly this time, for his eyes were smarting more than ever. Dr. Coppelius continued to take pairs of spectacles out of his pockets until the whole table was covered with them. I don't, began Nathaniel, feeling very cross. So you don't like any of these, Coppelius interrupted him. Gathering the spectacles up, he slipped them back into his pockets as quickly as he'd taken them out. I know what you want. I have the very thing. With that, he thrust his hand into an inside pocket of his coat and brought up what seemed a very ordinary pair of spectacles in dark frames. He leant over the table and slipped them onto Nathaniel's face. The young student was about to protest vigorously when he realized that the pain in his eyes had eased. Coppelius snatched up a book, opened it, and held it out. Though the print was some of the smallest, it was now as clear as anyone could wish. Look out of the window, commanded Coppelius, seizing Nathaniel's arm and dragging him across the room. Now look over the road. As usual, Olympia was sitting idle at the opposite window, but it seemed to Nathaniel as if a change had come over her. Though she did not move, he thought her face and eyes were full of life, and she appeared to be the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. He stood entranced until a loud cough from Capellius roused him. <clears throat> you haven't paid for the spectacles, Capellius reminded him. How much? asked Nathaniel, without taking his eyes from the opposite window. Three golden ducats, said Coppelius. Nathaniel thought this was extremely expensive and a great deal more than he could afford, but rather than take his eyes away from the window, he felt in his pocket and took out the money, which was all he had. Immediately, Coppelius snatched the coins and rushed out of the room, chortling with glee. Nathaniel's studies were quite forgotten as he stood gazing across the road, and it was not until it was too dark that he lit a candle and sat down at the table. Even then, he could not bring himself to work, for his thoughts were still with Olympia, and the only time he forgot her was when he took off the spectacles to go to bed. He spent all the next day watching Olympia, who still sat staring out of her window, and nothing his friends could say could stop him wasting his time. In the end, Lothair fetched Claire, hoping that the sight of her would restore Nathaniel to his senses, but he hardly spoke to her, so intent was he on gazing at his new love. She's such a dull creature, protested Lothair. Olympia is the most beautiful girl in the world, declared Nathaniel. I'm sure he's bewitched, Claire confided in her brother. They puzzled for hours over this strange enchantment, but neither of them thought of taking off the spectacles Nathaniel now wore every day. The professor is giving a ball, Lothair told his sister. He wants his daughter to meet young people of her own age, and he has sent invitations to most of the students in his class. I've torn up Nat so he won't know or be able to go. I think you should have let Nat go to the ball, said Claire. If he saw Olympia close to if he saw Olympia close to he would find out for himself how dull and stupid she is. Nevertheless, Nat did go to the ball, for Dr. Coppelius called on him again. You say you've not received an invitation, he said, after questioning Nathaniel. It'll be very difficult, but I think I might be able to get one for you. Of course it will be very expensive, but I don't suppose you will mind that. As Lothair had kept very quiet about the ball, Nathaniel had no idea the other students had been invited. The poor fellow parted with the last of his savings to buy the ticket from Dr. Capellius. He said nothing to his friends and waited eagerly for the day of the ball. When it came, he dressed himself in his best suit and set out sorely that he was the first guest to arrive. Olympia is looking forward to meeting you said the professor, who, with Dr. Coppelius, met him in the hall. The evening began with music, and one or two young ladies played the piano and sang, but Nathaniel thought them all dull and plain compared with Olympia. In time it was her turn, and dressed in a magnificent ball gown. She was led forward by her father, with Dr. Coppelius in close attendance. 
She certainly played with ease and accuracy. With as much expression as a hurdy-gurdy, declared Lothair, he had arrived late, but in time for Olympia's performance. Her playing is perfect, declared Nathaniel hotly. Too perfect, sneered Lothair. Never a wrong note, but no feeling either. After that, Olympia sang an aria with many trills and high notes, punctuated by several violent sneezes that made a number of students titter. Nathaniel was filled with delight by her clear voice and did not notice the sneezes. <laughs> as clear as a bell and as lifeless, complained Lothair in a whisper. Nathaniel scowled at him. And when Olympia's song came to an end on a very high note, followed by an extra loud sneeze, he clapped vigorously and cried, Encore! A number of people looked at him in amazement, and there was a great deal of whispering and giggling. However, it was now time for dancing. Though no one else went near Olympia, Nathaniel rushed forward. He is making himself look ridiculous, protested Lothair. Leave him alone, said Claire, who had come with her brother. Let him wear his legs out dancing with that doll. Doll, <laughs> exclaimed Lothair in surprise. That is what she is, said Claire. I have looked very closely at her. She is a large mechanical doll, and I think the professor is passing her off as his daughter to prove how clever he is. I don't know what Dr. Capellius hopes to gain, but I'm sure he had a hand in it. You see, no one knew that Nathaniel had paid three golden ducats for his spectacles. Or that he had given all his savings to Dr. Capellius for an invitation to the ball. That violent sneezing, said Claire, is the clockwork winding itself up each time it runs down. Round and round waltzed the doll Olympia with Nathaniel, who was forced to follow her steps and could hardly stop her when the music came to an end. What was more, she was ready for every dance and always finished as fresh as when she started. Though his feet were very tired, Nathaniel was so happy that he did not notice they were left to themselves all evening, any more than he realized that all of his vows of love, she never said anything but, ah, ah, with an occasional sneeze. You dance beautifully, he said. Ah, ah, replied she. What a beautiful dress you are wearing, he said. Ah, ah, said she. I love you dearly, said he. We're a, we're a shoo, shoo, replied she. What a bad cold you have, my darling, said he. Ah, ah, replied she. All the same, he is too entranced by her beauty to notice the shortness of her replies, and had he been asked, he would have said that she talked fluently all evening. In spite of his aching legs and feet, the time passed quickly, and it was not until he felt the professor's hand on his shoulder that he looked round to find that everyone else had gone home. It seems you have enjoyed yourself, said the professor. This is the most wonderful evening I have ever been, that I have ever spent, cried Nathaniel, and then blurted out, I love Olympia. Oh, uh, well, uh, well, began the professor. I am sure the professor will be delighted if you will call each day, said Dr. Capellius, pushing between them. In due course, we will announce your betrothal. The professor made another attempt to speak, but Dr. Capellius trod heavily on his foot. The next day, all the students talked much of the ball and passed many remarks on Olympia's silence and stiffness. They were sure she was simple-minded and that that was why her father had kept her hidden for so long. They also wondered at the great number of times she sneezed. This made Claire smile, though she said nothing. Instead, she walked up and down outside the professor's house until she saw Dr. Capellius coming. That is a very clever doll you and the professor have made, she said. It is a pity the clockwork makes such a noise. How do you know? asked Capellius, getting very red in the face. Who told you it was a doll? The professor, of course, she said, 
watching him very closely. Does Nathaniel know? asked Capellius. Certainly, she replied. He is not such a fool as you think. He is only pretending to think it is a girl. This was far from true, but Claire hoped to trick Capellius into telling Nathaniel the truth. The professor has broken our bargain, he cried, and rushed into the house. At once, Claire ran over to the students' lodgings. Nathaniel, she cried, you must go to Olympia. She needs you. There was no need to tell Nathaniel twice. He was out of the house, across the road, and into the professor's house before Claire could say any more. As he entered the hall, he was greeted by a confused din from the study. It was the sound of arguments, shouts, and even yells of rage accompanied by thumps and crashes. On opening the door, he saw the professor clutching Olympia by the shoulders while Coppelius was pulling at her feet, as if they were using her for a tug-of-war. "'Let go! She is mine!' shouted the professor. "'Without the eyes I put in, her face would be lifeless!' yelled Coppelius. "'I have given years of my life to this work!' cried the professor. "'You promised to keep the secret!' screamed Coppelius. "'Without my clockwork, she would be a mere dummy!' Let go! She is mine! Nathaniel stood for a moment, quite unable to understand what they were saying. It seemed to him that they were hurting his beautiful Olympia, and he hung himself on the professor, who fell back on the table, sending its contents to the floor with a crash. Coppelius now had Olympia by the waist, and swung her round so that her feet caught the advancing student full in the face and knocked him over, at the same time sweeping off his spectacles. Lothair and Claire, who had followed their friend, picked him up. He started forward, but stopped suddenly. Now that he was not wearing his spectacles, he saw Dr. Coppelius hurrying out of the room with a large doll over his shoulder. She's only a doll, he exclaimed in dismay, and putting his hand to his face, realized the trick that had been played on him. Where are my spectacles? Here they are, said Claire, picking them up and giving them to him. All that remained was the broken frame, for Olympia's shoe had smashed the lenses. It must have been the spectacles I bought from Dr. Capellius that made me so stupid, said Nathaniel. Then he turned to the professor. Why did you trick me? I meant to tell everyone the truth after the ball, said the professor. But Capellius wouldn't let me. Now he's run off with the doll, said Nathaniel. He may trick other students out of their money the way he did me. He can't make her move without my clockwork, said the professor. When we shook her between us, a good deal of it fell out. He will soon find she is of no use to him. And there, all over the floor, were springs and screws and little ratchet wheels. Nathaniel looked at Claire and leant over and pinched her arm very hard, just to make sure she was a real live girl. Soon after that, Nathaniel passed his examinations and he and Claire were married. In time, he became a professor, but he never again saw Dr. Coppelius or the doll Olympia. All the same, he was very cautious. Whenever Claire was silent for long, he would pinch her hard to make sure she had not been changed into a doll. Hmm. Funny what silence can do to someone, or a fair bit <laughs> of glasswork. We really do see things the way we choose to sometimes, and it's always curious what a fair bit of spectacles can do. So, more from Hoffman later. Uh, but now, some poems of passion. Now, Ella Wheeler Wilcox was a rather prolific writer, but this particular collection is only her love poems. And so I found a few. <laughs> now, as Shakespeare would say, the road of love... <laughs> well, I always, I always mess this up. The road of love is never, is never smooth, and her poems are not all flowers and sunshine, so we shall read a few of perhaps some of her darker work. 
And so, we shall begin, as I think appropriate, to follow the Hoffman story with the speech of silence. The solemn sea of silence lies between us. I know thou livest and thou lovest me, and yet I wish some white ship would come sailing across the ocean, bearing word from thee. The dead calm awes me with its awful stillness. No anxious doubts or fears disturb my breast. I only ask some little wave of language to stir this vast infinitude of rest. I am oppressed with this great sense of loving. So much I give, so much receive from thee. Like subtle incense rising from a censer, so floats the fragrance of thy love round me. All speech is poor, and written words unmeaning. Yet such I ask, blown hither by some wind, to give relief to this perfect knowledge, the silence so impresses on my mind. How poor the love that needeth word or message, to banish doubt or nourish tenderness. I ask them but to temper love's convictions, the silence all too fully doth express. Too deep the language which the spirit utters, too vast the knowledge which my soul hath stirred. Send some white ship across the sea of silence, and interrupt its utterance with a word. Hmm. We find again love and silence opposed to one another. Very curious. And now, for another poem, oh, I have lost my page a moment, called Ad Finem, which is certainly a much darker uh, approach to love. On the white throat of the useless passion that scorched my soul with its burning breath, I clutched my fingers in murderous fashion and gathered them close in a grip of death. For why should I fan or feed with fuel a love that showed me but blank despair? So my hold was firm and my grasp was cruel. I meant to strangle it then and there. I thought it was dead, but with no warning. It rose from its grave last night, and came, and stood by my bed still the early morning. And over and over it spoke your name. Its throat was red where my hands had held it. It burned my brow with its scorching breath. And I said, the moment my eyes beheld it, a love like this can know no death. For just one kiss that your lips have given in the lost and beautiful past to me i would gladly barter my hopes of heaven and all the bliss of eternity for never a joy are the angels keeping to lay at my feet in paradise like that of unto your arms your strong arms creeping and looking into your love-lit eyes I know in the way that sins are reckoned, this thought is a sin of the deepest dye. But I know, too, if an angel beckoned, standing close by the throne on high, and you, adown by the gates infernal, should open your loving arms and smile, I would turn my back on things supernal to lie on your breast a little while. To know for an hour you were mine completely, mine in body and soul, my own. I would bear unending tortures sweetly, with not a murmur and not a moan. A lighter sin or a lesser error might change through hope or fear divine, but there is no fear and hell hath no terror to change or alter a love like mine. Mm. Truly a monstrous passion. It puts me in the mood of Dracula uh, or Poe, uh, some of our other favorites. And 
I don't know about you, my friends, but I have certainly felt moments of overweening passion such as that, of being torn asunder by desire. We shall have more of Wilcox at a later date. But now we shall turn to Kipling. I am delighted these have now arrived, and we shall forthwith begin our adventures in the Jungle Book. So, we begin at the beginning with Mowgli's brothers in the Sioni wolf pack. It was seven o'clock of a very warm evening in the Sioni hills when Father Wolf woke up from his day's rest, scratched himself, yawned, and spread out his paws one after the other to get rid of the sleepy feeling in the tips. Mother Wolf lay with her big gray nose dropped across her four tumbling, squealing cubs, and the moon shone into the mouth of the cave where they all lived. Ah, said Father Wolf, it is time to hunt again. And he was going to spring downhill when a little shadow with a bushy tail crossed the threshold and whined, Good, go good luck go with you, O chief of the wolves, and good luck and strong white teeth go with the noble children, that they may never forget the hunger in this world. It was the jackal, Tabaki, the dish licker, and the wolves of India despise Tabaki because he runs about making mischief and telling tales and eating rags and pieces of leather from the village rubbish heaps. They are afraid of him too because Tabaki, more than anyone else in the jungle, is apt to go mad, and then he forgets that he was ever afraid of anyone, and runs through the forest biting everything in his way. Even the tiger hides when little Tabaki goes mad, for madness is the most disgraceful thing that can overtake a wild creature. We call it hydrophobia, but they call it dewani, the madness, and run. Enter then and look, said Father Wolf stiffly. But there is no food here. For a wolf, no, said Tabaki. But for so mean a person as myself, a dry bone is a good feast. Who are we, the Girderlog, the jackal people, to pick and choose? He scuttled to the back of the cave where he found the bone of a buck with some meat on it and sat cracking the end merrily. All thanks for this good meal, he said, licking his chops. How beautiful are the noble children, how large are their eyes, and so young, too. Indeed, indeed, I might have remembered that the children of kings are men from the beginning. Now Tabaki knew as well as anyone else that there is nothing so unlucky as to compliment children to their faces, and it pleased him to see mother and father wolf look uncomfortable. Tabaki sat still, rejoicing in the mischief that he had made, and then he said spitefully, Shere Khan, the big one, has shifted his hunting grounds. He will hunt among these hills during the next moon. So he has told me. Shere Khan was the tiger who lived near the Wangunga River, twenty miles away. He has no right, Father Wolf began angrily. By the law of the jungle, he has no right to change his quarters without fair warning. He will frighten every head of game within ten miles, and I... I have to kill for two these days. His mother did not call him Lungri, the lame one, for nothing, said Mother Wolf quietly. He has been lame in one foot from his birth. That is why he has only killed cattle. Now the villagers of the Wangunga are angry with him, and he has come here to make our villagers angry. They will scour the jungle for him when he is far away. And we and our children must run when the grass is set alight. Indeed, we are very grateful to Shere Khan. Shall I tell him of your gratitude? said Tabaki. Out! snapped Father Wolf. Out, and hunt with thy master. Thou hast done harm enough for one night. I go, said Tabaki quietly. Ye can hear Shere Khan below in the thickets. I might have saved myself the message. Father Wolf listened. And in the dark valley that ran down to a little river, he heard the dry, 
angry, snarly, sing-song whine of a tiger who has caught nothing and does not care if all the jungle knows it. The fool, said Father Wolf, to begin a night's work with that noise. Does he think that our bucks are like his fat Wingunga bullocks? Shh! It is neither bullocks nor buck that he hunts tonight, said Mother Wolf. It is man. The wine had changed to a sort of humming purr that seemed to roll from every quarter of the compass. It was the noise that bewilders woodcutters and gypsies sleeping in the open and makes them run sometimes into the very mouth of the tiger. Man, said Father Wolf, showing all his white teeth. Fa! Are there not enough beetles and frogs in the tanks that he must eat man and on our ground too? The law of the jungle, which never orders anything without a reason, forbids every beast to eat man except when he is killing to show his children how to kill, and then he must hunt outside the hunting grounds of his pack or tribe. The real reason for this is that man-killing means, sooner or later, the arrival of white men on elephants with guns and hundreds of brown men with gongs and rockets and torches. Then everybody in the jungle suffers. The reason the beasts give among themselves is that man is the weakest and most defenseless of all living things, and it is unsportsmanlike to touch him. They say too, and it is true, that man-eaters become mangy and lose their teeth. The purr grew louder and ended in the full-throated roar of the tiger's charge. Then there was a howl, an untigerish howl from Shere Khan. He is missed, said Mother Wolf. What is it? Father Wolf ran out a few paces and heard Shere Khan muttering and mumbling savagely as he tumbled about in the scrub. The fool has had no more sense than to jump at a wordcutter's campfire, so he has burned his feet, said Father Wolf with a grunt. Tabaki is with him. Something is coming uphill, said Mother Wolf, twitching one ear. Get ready. The bushes rustled a little in the thicket, and Father Wolf dropped with his haunches under him, ready for his leap. Then, if you had been watching, you would have seen the most wonderful thing in the world. The wolf checked in mid-spring. He made his bound before he saw what it was he was jumping at, and then he tried to stop himself. The result was that he shot up straight into the air for four or five feet, landing almost where he had left ground. Man, he snapped, a man's cub, look. Directly in front of him, holding on by a low branch, stood a naked brown baby who could just walk, as soft and as dimpled a little thing as ever came to a wolf's cave at night. He looked up into Father Wolf's face and laughed. Is that a man's cub? said Mother Wolf. I have never seen one. Bring it here. A wolf accustomed to moving his own cubs can, if necessary, mouth an egg without breaking it, and though Father Wolf's jaws closed right on the child's back, not a tooth even scratched the skin as he laid it down among the cubs. How little, how naked, and how bold, said Mother Wolf softly. The baby was pushing his way between the cubs to get close to the warm hide, Aha! He is taking his meal with the others. And so this is a man's cub. Now was there ever a wolf that could boast of a man's cub among her children? I have heard now and again of such a thing, but never in our pack or in my time, said Father Wolf. He is altogether without hair, and I could kill him with the touch of my foot. But see, he looks up and is not afraid. The moonlight was blocked out of the mouth of the cave for Shere Khan's great square head and shoulders were thrust into the entrance. Tabaki, behind him, was squeaking, My lord, my lord, in, it went in here. Shere Khan does us great honor, said Father Wolf, but his eyes were very angry. What does Shere Khan need? My quarry, a man's cub went this way said Shere Khan. Its parents have run off. Give it to me. 
Shere Khan had jumped at a woodcutter's campfire, as Father Wolf had said, and was furious from the pain of his burned feet. But Father Wolf knew that the mouth of the cave was too narrow for a tiger to come in by. Even where he was, Shere Khan's shoulders and forepaws were cramped for want of room, as a man's would be if he tried to fight in a barrel. The wolves are a free people, said Father Wolf. They take orders from the head of the pack, and not from any striped cattle killer. The man's cub is ours, to kill if we choose. Ye choose, and ye do not choose. What talk is this of choosing? By the bull that I killed, am I to stand nosing into your dog's den for my fair dues? It is I, Shere Khan, who speaks. The tiger's roar filled the cave with thunder. Mother Wolf shook herself clear of the cubs and sprang forward, her eyes like two green moons in the darkness, facing the blazing eyes of Shere Khan. And it is I, Raksha, the demon, who answer. The man's cub is mine, Lungri, mine to me. He shall not be killed. He shall live to run with the pack and to hunt with the pack, and in the end, look you, hunter of little naked cubs, frog-eater, fish-killer, he shall hunt thee. Now get hence, or by the sambur that I killed, I eat no starved cattle. Back thou goest to thy mother, burned beast of the jungle, lamer than even thou lamest, thou camest in the world. Go! Father Wolf looked on, amazed. He had almost forgotten the days when he won Mother Wolf in fair fight, from five other wolves, when she ran in the pack and was not called the demon for compliment's sake. Shere Khan might have faced Father Wolf, but he could not stand up against Mother Wolf, for he knew that where he was she had all the advantage of the ground and would fight to the death. So he backed out of the cave mouth, growling, and when he was clear he shouted, Each dog barks in his own yard. We will see what the pack will say to this fostering of man-cubs. The cub is mine, and to my teeth he will come in the end, O oh, bush-tailed thieves. Mother Wolf threw herself down, panting among the cubs, and Father Wolf said to her gravely, Shere Khan speaks this much truth. The cub must be shown to the pack. Wilt thou still keep him, mother? Keep him, she gasped. He came naked by night, alone and very hungry, yet he was not afraid. Look, he has pushed one of my babes to one side already. And that lame butcher would have killed him and would have run off to the Wangunga, while the villagers were hunted through all our lairs in revenge. Keep him. Assuredly I will keep him. Lie still, little frog. O thou Mowgli, for Mowgli the frog... I will call thee. The time will come when thou wilt hunt Shere Khan as he has hunted thee. But what will our pack say? said Father Wolf. The law of the jungle lays down very clearly that any wolf may, when he marries, withdraw from the pack he belongs to. But as soon as his cubs are old enough to stand on their feet, he must bring them to the pack council, which is generally held once a month at full moon in order that the other wolves may identify them. After that inspection, the cubs are free to run where they please, and until they have killed their first buck, no excuse is accepted if a grown wolf of the pack kills one of them. Punishment is death where the murderer can be found, and if you think for a minute, you will see that this must be so. Father Wolf waited till his cubs could run a little, and then on the night of the pack meeting, took them and Mowgli and Mother Wolf to the Council Rock, a hilltop covered with stone and boulders where a hundred wolves could hide. Akela, the great gray lone wolf who led all the pack by strength and cunning, lay out at full length on his rock, and below him sat forty or more wolves of every size and color, from badger-colored veterans who could handle a buck alone to young black three-year-olds who thought they could. The lone wolf had led them for a year now. He had fallen twice into a wolf trap in his youth, and once he had been beaten and left for dead, 
so he knew the manners and customs of men. There was very little talking at the rock. The cubs tumbled over one another in the center of the circle where their mothers and fathers sat, and now and again a senior wolf would go quietly up to a cub, look at him carefully, and return to his place on noiseless feet. Sometimes a mother would push her cub far out into the moonlight to be sure that he had not been overlooked. Akela from his great rock would cry, Ye know the law! Ye know the law! Look well, O wolves! And the anxious mothers would take up the call, Look! Look well, O wolves! At last, when Mother Wolf's neck bristles lifted as the time came, Father Wolf pushed Mowgli the frog, as they called him, into the center, where he sat laughing and playing with some pebbles that glistened in the moonlight. Akela never raised his head from his paws, but went on with the monotonous cry, Look well! A muffled roar came up from behind the rocks, the voice of Shere Khan crying, The cub is mine. Give him to me. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Akela never even twitched his ears. All he said was, Look well, O oh wolves! What have the free people to do with the orders of any save the free people? Look well! There was a chorus of deep growls, and a young wolf in his fourth year flung back Shere Khan's question to Akela. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Now the law of the jungle lays down that if there is any dispute as to the right of a cub to be accepted by the pack, he must be spoken for by at least two members of the pack who are not his father and mother. Who speaks for this cub? said Akela. Among the free people, who speaks? There was no answer, and Mother Wolf got ready for what she knew would be her last fight, if things came to fighting. Then the only other creature who was allowed at the pack council, Baloo, the sleepy brown bear, who teaches the wolf cubs the law of the jungle, old Baloo, who can come and go where he pleases, because he eats only nuts and roots and honey, rose up on his hindquarters and grunted. The man's cub, the man's cub, he said. I speak for the man's cub. There is no harm in a man's cub. I have no gift of words, but I speak the truth. Let him run with the pack and be entered with the others. I myself will teach him. We need yet another, said Akela. Baloo has spoken, and he is our teacher for the young cubs. Who speaks besides Baloo? A black shadow dropped down into the circle. It was Bagheera, the black panther, inky black all over, but with the panther markings showing up in certain lights like the pattern of watered silk. Everybody knew Bagheera, and nobody cared to cross his path, for he was as cunning as Tabaki, as bold as the wild buffalo, and as reckless as the wounded elephant. But he had a voice as soft as wild honey dripping from a tree and a skin softer than down. O oh, Akela, and ye, the free people, he purred, I have no right in your assembly, but the law of the jungle says that if there is a doubt which is not a killing matter in regards to a new cub, the life of that cub may be bought at a price, and the law does not say who may or may not pay that price. Am I right? Good, good, said the young wolves who were always hungry. Listen to Bagheera. The cub can be bought for a price. It is the law. Knowing that I have no right to speak here, I ask your leave. Speak, then, cried twenty voices. To kill a naked cub is shame. Besides, he may make better sport for you when he is grown. Baloo has spoken on his behalf. Now to Baloo's word I will add one bowl and a fat one, newly killed. Not half a mile from here, if you will accept the man's cub according to the law. Is it difficult? There was a clamor of scores of voices saying, What matter? He will die in the winter rains. He will scorch in the sun. What harm can a naked frog do us? Let him run with the pack. Where is the bull, Bagheera? Let him be accepted. And then came Akela's deep bay, crying, Look well, look well, O wolves! Mowgli 
was still playing with the pebbles, and he did not notice when the wolves came and looked at him, one by one. At last they all went down the hill for the dead bull, and only Akela, Bagheera, Baloo, and Mowgli's own wolves were left. Shere Khan roared still in the night, for he was very angry that Mowgli had not been handed over to him. Ay, roar well, said Bagheera under his whiskers. For the time comes when this naked thing will make thee roar to another tune, or I know nothing of man. It was well done, said Akela. Men and their cubs are very wise. He may be a help in time. Truly a help in time of need, for none can hope to lead the pack forever, said Bagheera. Akela said nothing. He was thinking of the time that comes to every leader of every pack when his strength goes from him and he gets feebler and feebler till at last he is killed by the wolves and a new leader comes up to be killed in his turn. Take him away, he said to Father Wolf, and train him as befits one of the free people. And that is how Mowgli was entered into the C &E wolf pack for the price of a bull and on Baloo's good word. We shall leave Mowgli and his adventures there, but we shall return to this soon. And now, as we near the end of our time, we shall once again visit our good master Peeps and see what he is getting up to during his time in London. Mm. 1660, January the 14th. Nothing to do at our office. Mm. Thence into the hall, and just as I was going to dinner from Westminster Hall with Mr. Moore, with whom I had been in the lobby to hear news and had spoke with Sir Anthony Ashley Cooper about my lord's lodgings, to his house I met with Captain Holland, who told me that he had brought his wife to my house, so I posted home and got a dish of meat for them. They stayed with me all the afternoon and went hence in the evening, then I went with my, life, with my wife and left her at market and went myself to the coffee house and heard exceeding good argument against Mr. Harrington's assertion that overbalance of propriety was the foundation of government. Home and wrote to Hitchingbrook and sent that and my other letters that missed of going on Thursday last. So to bed. January the 15th. Having been exceedingly disturbed in the night with the barking of a dog of one of our neighbors, that I could not sleep for an hour or two, I slept late, and then in the morning took physic, and so stayed within all day. At noon my brother John came to me, and I corrected as well as I could his Greek speech against the apposition, though I believe he himself was as well able to do it as myself. After that we went to read in the great official about the blessings of bells in the Church of Rome. After that, my wife and I, in pleasant discourse till night, that I went to supper, and after that, to make an end of this week's notes in this book, and so to bed. It being a cold day and a great snow, my physic did not work so well as it should have done. January the 16th. In the morning, I went up to Mr. Cruz, and at his bedside, he gave me direction to go tomorrow with Mr. Edwards to Twickenham, and likewise did talk to me concerning things of state, and expressed his mind how just it was that the secluded members should come to sit again. I went from thence, and in my way went into an alehouse, and drank my morning draught with Matt Andrews, and two or three more of his friends, coachmen, and of one of them I did hire a coach to carry us tomorrow to Twickenham. From thence to my office, where nothing to do. But Mr. Downing, he came and found me all alone, and did mention to me his going back into Holland, and did ask me whether I would go or no, uh, but gave me little encouragement, but bid me consider of it, and asked me whether I did not think that Mr. Hawley could perform the work of the office alone or no. I confess I was at a great loss all the day after to bethink myself how to carry this business. At noon, Harry Ethel came to me and went along with Mr. Maylard by coach as far as Salisbury Court, and there we set him down and we went to the clerks, 
where we came a little too late. But in a closet, we had a very good dinner by Mr. Pinckney's courtesy. And after dinner, we had pretty good singing and one hazard song alone after the old fashion, which was very much cried up. But I did not like it. Thence we went to the Green Dragon on Lambeth Hill. Both uh, Mr. Pinckney's, Smith, Harrison, Morris, that sang the bass, Shepley and I, and there we sang of all sorts of things, and I ventured, with good success, upon things at first sight, and after that played on my flagellette, and stayed there till nine o'clock, very merry, and drawn on with one song after another, till it came to be so late. After that, Shepley, Harrison, and myself, we went towards Westminster on foot, and at the Golden Lion, near Charing Cross, we went in and drank a pint of wine, and so parted, and thence home, where I found my, my wife and made a washing. I sat up till the bellman came by with his bell, just under my window, as I was writing of this very line, and cried, Past one of the clock, and a cold, frosty, windy morning. I then went to bed, and left my wife and the maid a washing still. January the 17th. Early, I went to Mr. Cruz, and having given Mr. Edwards money to give the servants, I took him into the coach that waited for us and carried him to my house, where the coach waited for me while I and the child went to the Westminster Hall and bought him some pictures. In the hall, I met Mr. Woodfine and took him to Will's and drank with him. Thence the child and I to the coach, where my wife was ready, and so we went towards Twickenham. In our way at Kensington, we understood how that my lord Chesterfield had killed another gentleman about half an hour before, and was fled. We went forward, and came about one of the clock to Mr. Fuller's, but he was out of town. So we had a dinner there, and I gave the child forty shillings to give to the two ushers. After that, we parted, and went homewards, it being market day at Branford. I sent my wife down and went with the coach to Mr. Cruz, thinking to have spoke with Mr. Moore and Mrs. Jane. He, having told me the reason of his melancholy for some unkindness from her after so great expressions of love, and how he had spoke to her friends and had their consent, and that he would desire me to take an occasion of speaking with her, but by no means not to heighten her discontent or distaste, whatever it be, but to make it up if I can. But he, being out of doors, I went away and went to see Mrs. Jemima, who was now very well again. And after a game or two at cards, I left her. So I went to the coffee club and heard very good discourse. It was an answer to Mr. Harrington's answer, who said that the state of the Roman government was not a settled government, and so it was no wonder that the balance of propriety was in one hand and the command in another, it being therefore always in a posture of war, but it was carried by ballot that it was a steady government, though it is true by the voices it had been carried before that it was an unsteady government. So tomorrow it is to be proved by the opponents that the balance lie in one hand and the government in the other. Thence I went to Westminster and met Shaw and Washington, who told me how this day Sydenham was voted out of the House for setting any more this Parliament, and that Salloway was voted out likewise and sent to the tower during the pleasure of the house. Home, and wrote by the post, and carried it to Whitehall, and coming back, turned in at Harper's, where Jack Price was, and I drank with him, and he told me, among other things, how much the protector is altered. Though he would seem to bear out his trouble very well, yet he is scarce able to talk sense with a man, and how he will say that, who should a man trust if he may not trust to a brother and an uncle? and how much those men have to answer before God Almighty, for their playing each the knaves with him as they did. He told me also that there was one hundred thousand pounds offered, and would have been taken for his restitution, had not the Parliament come in as they did again, and that he doth believe that the Protector will live to give a testimony of his valour and revenge yet before he dies, and that the protector will say so himself sometimes. Thence I went home, it being late, and my wife in bed. January the 18th. To my office, and from thence to Will's, and there Mr. Shepley brought my letters from the carrier, and so I went home. 
After that, to Wilkinson's, where we had a dinner for Mr. Talbot, Adams, Pinckney, and his son, but his son did not come. Here we were very merry, and while I was here, Mr. Fuller came thither and stayed a little while. After that, we all went to my lord's, whither came afterwards Mr. Harrison, and by chance, seeing Mr. Butler coming by, I called him in, and so we sat, drinking a bottle of wine till night, at which time Mrs. Anne came with the key of my lord's study for some things, and so we all broke up. And after I had gone to my house and interpreted my lord's letter by his character, I came to her again and went with her to her lodging, and from thence to Mr. Crewe's, where I advised with him what to do about my lord's lodgings, and what answer to give to Sir Anthony Cooper. And so I came home and to bed. All the world is now at a loss to think what Monk will do, the city saying that he will be for them, and the parliament saying he will be for them. So we will leave Mr. Pepys there. It's an interesting time. He finds himself at work with nothing to do quite often, a situation I believe we may be sympathetic towards at the moment. But that leaves us in a good spot. And that, I believe, shall conclude our time this week. As always, I am overjoyed that you have spent an hour listening to my tales, and I look forward to you coming and spending another hour with me again soon. I am the storyteller. Thank you. See you soon.